Okay, this morning's going to be a little bit different because um, we're doing Daniel 3 and 4, and there's going to be a lot of reading because basically I don't want to screw up telling the story, so it's just easier to, uh, to read it. And it's a good enough story that, uh, you know, please forgive the amount of slides that are going to be up there a little bit more than usual, but um, I want to make sure I, I don't screw the story up, so I'm cheating and reading aloud. Um, first slide. But wait, you said we're talking about Daniel. Hey, I want you to read this and keep this in the back of your mind. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is John 14, 15, uh, Jesus speaking to his apostles. I want you to keep that in mind as we go into Daniel and start talking about it because this is kind of, I would say, foundational to the two stories we're going to read today. Uh, next slide. So to review, John, John did a good historical review. I thought it'd be nice to have something uh, visual so you can kind of understand when this was happening. So the Israelites were taken, Judah was sacked by Nebuchadnezzar um, in around six, 605 B.C., so 600 years before Christ. Nebuchadnezzar comes in and decides that he's going to take Judah, and he's, he's basically on his first slave shopping trip, and he picks... Uh, picks the best ones first and takes them back with him to Babylon. Um, but the whole period of time from when they were taking slaves in 605 B.C. to about 535 B.C., this is a 70-year period. And it's, it's important to remember that because all these stories over the next... How many weeks, John? you got to do math. Another, another four weeks. All these stories happen over a 70-year period of time. And I know when I first started reading the Bible, it's really easy to go, okay, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, they all got kind of snatched, and everything happens when they're 15 years old, and it doesn't. These guys go through their entire lives as slaves over a 70-year period, you know, which, which would be an interesting thing to get snatched up when you're a teenager and held in captivity until well after you've had your AARP card. So keep that in mind as we go through the story. Uh, and next slide. Another important thing is, okay, where were these places? Where, you know, where is Jerusalem? Where's Israel? Where's Babylon? Current day, I think we, we probably all are aware of where Israel is. Babylon is basically Iraq. Um, and it's lovely, lovely this time of year. It's all brown, always, uh, and hot. So when they were taken captive, if you look and you see the rivers, they didn't just walk from, from Jerusalem over to Babylon because I've seen that part of the world. And that's not a part of the world you just wander through because there's absolutely nothing there and no water. That's a good way to end up dead quick. So they would have had to take the longer route up to the Euphrates and then back down. So not only do you get kidnapped, you don't even get to walk to, uh, walk to prison, the shortcut. You've got to go the long way to get to prison. So this is kind of where they were. This is where they started. And other important thing, um, next slide is why were they there? I mean, the, the Israelites, these are God's chosen people that like we've heard about. Um, how did God allow them to be taken captive? And Second Chronicles 36, 17 through 21 kind of gets to it. Therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans are also Babylonian, basically the same group of people. We could call them modern-day Iraqis, whatever. The king of the Chaldeans who killed the young men with the sword of their house, in the, in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged, he gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar shows up, he destroys everything, takes everything, and takes it all back to Babylon. They burned the house of God, I'd say that's a bad move, Nebuchadnezzar, but, you know, hey, keep rocking. Uh, and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. The reason God allowed this to happen was basically from the time of King Solomon to, to this time, the Israelites had basically been kind of spiraling down, becoming more evil. Each, each king kind of outdid his father, in, in, in a level of evil and, and taking the Israelites, you know, further and further 
away from God and deeper and deeper into sin. And eventually God got to the point where he was like, okay, time out. I'm getting my belt out. We're going to correct this. And my belt has the name Nebuchadnezzar. And there's, there's prophecy that this exile would happen for 70 years. And God's pretty good about keeping his word. So that's kind of where we get to. Nebuchadnezzar has now shown up. He's now taken everybody, like John said. He took the best ones first, uh, obviously wanting, uh, one is, wanting his first round of slaves to be the, kind of the prime ones. So that's where, that's where the four that are, make up this book pretty much come from. Next slide. So now's the story. King Nebuchadnezzar, this is, and remember from John's, John's message last week about Daniel interpreting the first dream until now is a 20-year period. So this didn't happen immediately. Uh, this is 20 years after the interpretation of the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar had seen God's power already when he has Daniel not only interpret the dream, but he has to tell him what the dream is first. So in God giving Daniel that power, Nebuchadnezzar has seen a pretty good sample of what God can do, but did it really change his heart? Uh, I would say not. So Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. Doing the math, a cubit is a foot and a half, so it's 90 feet by 9 feet. So it's a big statue. Somebody said it's about two-thirds the size of the Statue of Liberty. So Nebuchadnezzar was pretty much in love with himself. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, satraps, prefects, and the governors and counselors. What's a satrap? What's a prefect? It's another word for these are the political elites. These are the people that are in charge of, of stuff, uh, and they just had different names other than city councilmen. Uh, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and the officials of the province come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Hey, I've made this great image probably of myself, and I think you should come see it. The herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded. What's a herald? Probably the loudest guy in the room. Who can, who can bellow the most so the most people hear it when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar wants him to uh, get his message out? You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. That when you hear the, how, the, hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, dubstep, whatever kind of music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever, this is, this is the real important part, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. So pretty, pretty much most people there are like, okay, that's easy. I hear music, I just drop, drop in my face. Um... There were a few that, uh, well, that weren't in with that. Uh, next slide. So if you remember from, from, uh, from John, let's see, I lost my place, forgive me. Yeah, okay. I didn't lose my place, I just can't read. So John's message last week, and he's talking about the slaves and... The king's picking out the best of the best. King spoke with them, and among all of them was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, a.k.a. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired, he found them ten times better than all the magicians, enchanters that were in his kingdom. So I'm guessing, you know, now we're 20 years later, and these guys are still proving they're ten times better more than likely, the townies weren't real fond of the, uh, the guys that recruited and brought in. So you have a little bit of jealousy. Um, and that's what causes the next thing. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans, we'll call them the townies, came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Best to start out brown-nosing if you're going to ask him to kill some people. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace. And oh, by the way, teacher, there are certain Jews who you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. So not only, these guys are pretty bold, like, yeah, you appointed them. These are your guys. 
and they don't obey you. So it's a pretty bold move on the squealer's part, but there are certain Jews from who you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image you set up. So with that, I think, you know, and nowadays the term snitches get stitches, I think applies to these guys. Um, but it's a good thing I wasn't back then because... I'd already be in the fiery furnace. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they were a little cooler about it. Nebuchadnezzar, he loses his cool. In a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve the, my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Uh, and now they, they maintain their cool, but they weren't... Uh, they weren't going to bow down either. Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, blah, 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 to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. It's all cool. Water under the bridge. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And this is, this is the line that kind of cracks me up. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And they're probably thinking, we know, we got the answer. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. I'm sure that went over well. If, if, if that's truly how they answered, you can just see like a blood vessel coming out of his forehead when they, when they say this. Like, I don't really have to answer you. You're not, you're not the guy I worship. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O King. But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. So they basically say, the best you're ever going to be is a silver medal because we worship God and we are never going to worship you. If he saves us from the fire, cool. If he doesn't, you're still second round, you're not first. So obviously, Nebuchadnezzar being a bit of a hothead, uh, as proven throughout history already, Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he went from, like, livid to, I don't even know the right word. I probably shouldn't use it here. He, was ordered, he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, I'm not sure how you do that, if they have extra fuel they pour in, extra logs, coal. But I'm sure all his other slaves are shoveling coal and throwing as much wood in there because, like, the boss is ticked, and he's... He's screaming, yelling. He ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he gets, you know, Brutus and Mongo to, to wrap these guys up and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. These men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. So I can see Nebuchadnezzar going, not only do I want to burn these guys alive, I want no trace of them. So wrap them in all their clothes, and we're going to burn all that stuff too. So he's losing his mind. Because the king's order was was urgent, and the furnace overheated. The flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So now, now he's got to explain to the wives of Mongo and Brutus why their husbands are dead, because he was a little bit too wound up. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the burning, fiery furnace. So at this time, you're thinking, okay, Nebuchadnezzar finally gets his, gets his justice. These, these guys that won't bow down to me, won't worship my statue... I got them. I'm just going to listen for their screams while they burn alive. And he doesn't hear anything. King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, do we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered, true, O king. But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire. They're not hurt. They're not screaming like I want them to. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door, burning fiery furnace, and declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High, come out and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego came out from the fire. And the whole group, all the elites, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed, cloaks not harmed, no smell of fire had come on them. Who's ever gone to a campfire and been... 50 feet from it. And when you get home, you're like, yep, I've, I've been near a campfire. These guys are inside the furnace and they come out. 
no Febreze needed. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. So this is kind of his second experience with God, and maybe he's starting to realize that there's, there's something bigger than him. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people or nation or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruin. For there's no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So these guys had... pretty much the definition of unshakable faith. They weren't going to bow down to anyone, no matter how powerful, even if death was, even if death was guaranteed by, by the one wanting to make them bow down. I, I wish I could say, man, I, my faith is that strong, I could have done that. Like, no, I'd have probably been the mouthy one getting, you know, getting stabbed first before I got put in the fire. Um, but this is, you have to remember with this, these aren't teenagers. And, and no offense, anybody that's 15 to 17, these are 35-year-old men who have been slaves and have been continuing to grow in their faith together along with Daniel. Uh, so by the time this happened, God had prepared them very well and their faith was even deeper in, in the one true God than before they were taken. So, interesting thing. Ring of Fire, John's already played it. Um, is, is kind of the theme for the, at least in my mind, the theme for the, the first message for Daniel 3. Does anybody, and John, you don't get the answer because you already looked at the slides because you cheat. Does anybody know what's on the flip side of Johnny Cash's single that had Ring of Fire? You're absolutely right. Next slide. <laughs> I'd still be there, which made me laugh because I didn't know either. And I'm looking it up, and I found that, and it's like, I'd still be there. Well, that's pretty applicable for guys that are stuck in Babylon for 70 years. It's like, yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I'd still be there. So going on to Daniel 4. Nebuchadnezzar, he's, like, like we said, he's seen, he's seen a couple of miracles over the past 20 years, some pretty impressive things. You know, the, the interpreting a dream is one, but then watching three guys... Uh, also accompanied by what some you know, think may have been Jesus, it may have been an angel. Whatever it was, God delivered them from, from a certain death of fire. Um, Nebuchadnezzar has seen this in the past 20 to 25 years. And I'm thinking, you know, if, if, you'd, if I'd been blessed to see this kind of, uh, this, this, these levels of miracles, I might be a little more inclined to, to worship God, but at the same time, also knowing myself, I might not because I forget things pretty fast in 20 to 25 years is a pretty good time to erase uh, what I'd seen. So going forward now, this is n another 20 years before Daniel 4 really happens. So now the four, the four young men are all, yeah, they're about my age, they're old. So Daniel 4 happens. Um, 15 to 20 years later after Daniel 3, and Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar gets a, little, gets a little shaken up by this dream, but not quite to the level of his first one where he's like, all right, not only am I going to not tell you what it is, and you've got to tell me what I dreamt, but then you've got to interpret it. This time, Nebuchadnezzar cuts everybody a little bit of slack and says, I just need somebody to interpret this. His... Uh, his towny magicians and you know, sorcerers and whatever else couldn't do it. And then he remembers, oh yeah, 40 years ago there was this guy, and I, I think he's still around the palace somewhere, Daniel. Calls for Daniel. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders the Most High God has done for me. So he's telling us he's impressed with God. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. So now he's talking to Daniel saying, need some help here. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. So 
a tree I can see. I can't even see the trees in my house. So this thing had to be massive if you can see it from the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant. And, it was, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of heaven lived in its branches. And all the flesh was fed from it. I saw, all the visions, I saw the visions of my head as I lay in bed. And behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and thus chop down the tree lop off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it, and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let the beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. Seven periods of time in this means seven years. The sentence is by decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream my king Nebuchadnezzar saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, a.k.a. Daniel, tell me this interpretation because all the wise men of my kingdom, they still don't have it. Are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. This is kind of funny, the spirit of the holy gods. Like, it's lowercase. He's still not fully on board that the God of the universe, the one that created all of us, is, is, what Dan, you know, is, is who's powering Daniel. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while. Because immediately Daniel's like, I know what this dream means, and I really don't want to break this news to him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or interpretation alarm you. Like, I know what you do to people that give you bad news. Of course it's alarming me. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw which grew and became strong so this top reached to heaven and it was visible from the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and in which food was food for all under which the beasts of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived? It's you, O king. Which, okay, that sounds good, right? I'm, I'm, that, I'm that big super tree. Except the story goes on. Who have grown strong and, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High. God's saying it which has come upon my lord the king, that you shall be driven among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods, seven years of time, shall pass over you. You're going to be, you're going to be a beast of burden. You're going to be, a, be wandering around like a cow in a field for the next seven years till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree. Your kingdom shall be confirmed from you from the time that you know that heaven rules. So at seven years, you're finally going to figure it out that God's in charge and you aren't. And your, your kingdom will come back to you. Therefore, O king, this, this is probably the toughest part for Daniel. <laughs> Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. I just told you you're going to be an ox for seven years. So we're still cool, right? Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. So this is pretty good advice. Obviously, Nebuchadnezzar, God's been using Nebuchadnezzar for the past 40 years to, uh, to, to punish Israel. But at the same time, Nebuchadnezzar's not really a follower of God. He's just kind of a, a, a tool God has been using. All this came upon ne King Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of 12 months, so you, so, so you just got this word from Daniel telling you what's going to happen. The last thing he told you was going to happen has happened, and you still forget. At the end of 12 months, so a year later after Daniel tells him, you're going away soon, bud. At the end of 12 months, he was t walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, is this not great Babylon, which I have built with 
my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty. I'm kind of a big deal. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar. I, I can just see God kind of shaking his head. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven among, from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. So there's his reality check. At the end of days, so let's, let's, let's fast forward now. Seven years, Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's been running around eating grass. Uh, ox, ox man, hair's all grown out. He's looking a little shaggy. I, I thought of the image of oh, that Leonardo DiCaprio movie, The Aviator, where he's Howard Hughes, and when he goes crazy and his fingernails are all long and his hair is terrible. I almost put that up there, but it's kind of disturbing, so I didn't. At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say, none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and this is Nebuchadnezzar kind of narrating, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors, my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. So, with this, with, with John back in mind, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We've got, we've got two, two sides of the same album. We've got you know, the same Johnny Cash 45, if you want to say. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We've got the perfect example, the three amigos who were very faithful, even, even with the threat of death. And then we've got Nebuchadnezzar, who really, in my mind, represents me. Someone who's sinful, someone who is more focused on myself more often probably than I'm focused on God. And God is faithful to both. Did God deliver the three from the fire? Yes. Did he give them, you know, did he set them free? No. God's going to do what God's going to do. He has a plan. We don't always understand what it is. And we may not understand it until the time we actually meet him. But he knows what's best for us. He has a plan for us, and there's a, what we can learn from, from, from John 14, 15 is, it doesn't say, if you want me to save you, you will keep my commandments. He's already saved all of us. Before we are ever born, he died for our sins, for, before the sins we've ever committed up to this point. And for the sins that I'm pretty sure I'm going to commit probably later today, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm far from perfect. I can't get it right. I don't, I don't get saved because of my actions. But if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is how we show him we love him. This is, this, this is all he's asking is, I came, I died for you, for your sins, for the sins you, you've done, for the sins you will do. I died for that because I loved you first. So it's very simple. Are we going to ever be able to keep all his commandments? No. I think that's, 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 the, that's the fallacy. We keep trying to get better at it. We keep trying to focus more, asking him to help us with whatever our sins are so we, so we don't do them. I'd like to be like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. I'm probably going to end up, hopefully not, running around in a field eating grass and with long Howard Hughes hair. But somewhere in the middle, I would... I'd rather try to get it right before he humbles me, <laughs> but that doesn't always happen. So that's kind of how these two tie together. We've got good examples and bad examples. Um, we're all sinners. We all lean towards the bad examples. The good thing is God does not give up on us. If God didn't give up on Nebuchadnezzar, breathe a sigh of relief. He's not going give to give up on you either. Uh, so pray with me. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for stories 
like Daniel 3 and Daniel 4, giving us examples of unshakable faith, of what we should strive to be like. But thank you also for, for the bad examples, the Nebuchadnezzars, because they're in ways much more relatable. And it lets us know that you don't give up on us. Be with us as we go out this week. Help us to focus our faith on you and strive to be like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Make you first in our lives. Not let anything get in the way. And even if we're not able to focus on you, if sin gets in the way, Lord, please humble us if necessary. Just don't give up on us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 